Good evening, everybody, and welcome to If Oxford, the Science and Ideas Festival. My name's Cathy, I'm the festival manager, and I will be your host for this evening. But without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Tom Crawford, a mathematician at St Edmund Hall at the University of Oxford, but known to many from uh, various websites, Tom Rocks Maths, Number File, and possibly my favourite, The Naked Mathematician. Uh, although Tom has assured me he will not be taking his clothes off today. Um, so over to you, Tom, fully clothed. Thank you, Cathy. Um, right, so let's just get going again. Okay, perfect. That's hopefully ready to rock and roll. Right, thank you very much. Um, and hello, good evening, everybody. Um, so as Cathy has said, I'm gonna to talk to you all today about the, uh, the seven, one million dollar maths problems. Um, so sometimes the, the title is possibly misleading and saying seven million dollar problems. Um, there are seven millennium problems. Each of them uh, is worth one million dollars. I should be able to get to, I think, three or so uh, during this talk. We will be asking you to vote for which ones you would like me to talk about. Uh, so it's your chance to pick, perhaps. So most of the time, everyone votes for the ones they've heard of which is great and I'm more than happy to talk about literally any of the problems. However, it might also be quite fun to think about voting for the ones that you've not heard of, uh, perhaps to learn something completely new. Um, so I will give you a brief overview of them all to kind of try and entice you a little bit um, as well. So um, the Millennium Problems then, as I mentioned, they are a series of seven uh, maths problems, each worth $1 million. Um, and these were announced in the year 2000, uh, hence the name Millennium Problems. It was kind of maths decided to jump on the Millennium bandwagon. Uh, so any of you watching who were alive in the year 2000, I just about remember this. I was about 10 or so, 10 or 11 at the time. Uh, everything in the year 2000 was let's do something called the Millennium Blank. Uh, and maths basically jumped on the bandwagon, as I said, and, and did the Millennium Problems. Now, the... Um, Organization behind this uh, is the Clay Institute. This is their, their logo, the Clay Maths Institute based in the US and also has an office here in Oxford, in fact. Um, so they were left a lot of money um, and one of the conditions on, on this donation was that it would be used to help further uh, engagement in maths at a research level and beyond. And so one of their ideas was to run the, the Millennium Problems, was to try and encourage more and more people to engage with maths at a research level um, by basically saying, we will give you a million dollars if you happen to solve any of these current outstanding problems. Now to select the, the problems, um, there was a scientific advisory board made up of various famous mathematicians at the time. And they were asked to decide the problems based on the following uh, condition is that it must be a classical problem that has resisted solution for many years. Now this statement alone is incredibly interesting because I think my favorite thing about it or the thing I find most interesting about it is it doesn't mention that any of these problems must be completely groundbreaking in that they're going to change our perception of the world or change our daily lives. So whilst for most of them, that would indeed actually happen, I think, over quite a short period of time. That wasn't necessarily a condition. These were just, this is kind of saying, we want really, really, really hard maths problems um, because it's got to a resisted solution for many years. So it has to be something that people have tried, that various famous mathematicians, very intelligent people have tried to solve, for whatever reason can't. And it, that was kind of, the, and we're going to add this additional incentive. Apart from it being an amazing problem, let's also give out a uh, million dollars as well. And in case you hadn't noticed, I am wearing my, uh, my million dollar t-shirts to sort of blend in with the, uh, with the background here. Now, the, um, so the problems themselves, I'm going to give you a, um, well, actually, before I tell you about the problems themselves, um, I, I always forget. This is my chance to show you my favorite uh, clip from Family Guy. Uh, because it's a very, two, for two reasons. One of them I'll tell you afterwards, but the other one is basically, if you happen to win the million dollars, please do not do what Peter does when he wins the lottery in this clip. Okay, 
hey, everybody just calm down. We're not going to go crazy spending our winnings, and we're not going to let this money change us. What are you talking about? This money is our ticket to the good life. Starting now. I just bought a giant room full of gold coins, and I'm going to dive into it like Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> It's not a liquid. It's a great many pieces of solid matter. They form a hard floor-like surface. Ah! Uh, so don't do that at home. Um, and also, the, the, reason, the reason I like this clip, uh, as well as I think it's very funny, is um, that as someone who works in fluid mechanics, if I was to model a room full of gold coins, you would actually model the coins as though they were a fluid. Um, so it's a bit of a niche joke, but it's something else that makes me really appreciate uh, that particular clip. So the seven problems, I'm going to give you a quick one minute rundown of each of them, uh, and then we will open the first poll, uh, and then I will talk in more detail about the one that, that you will vote for. So the first one on the list, perhaps the most famous, uh, the Riemann hypothesis. Um, and I've tried to give a, a sort of a one line uh, description of the problem and hopefully something that most of you can understand. So the Riemann hypothesis is kind of asking, uh, is there a hidden pattern to where the prime numbers appear on the number line? Um, and this has lots and lots of applications, in particular for internet security and cryptography, which is where we have this picture of a credit card with a padlock. So Riemann hypothesis is going to be the first one of the seven problems you can vote for. Uh, the second one, is P versus NP. This is all to do with computers, robots, artificial intelligence, hence the picture of Wally. -E. Um, now, this is uh, to do with algorithms and how computers solve problems. And it asks us to compare two different types of problem, those which we call uh, NP problems, which are problems that are easy for a computer to check or to mark the solution. And then we have P problems, which are problems that a computer finds easy to solve in the first place. And this question, million dollar question, asks, are those two the same thing? Or are there some problems that are in one group, but not the other? So if you're interested in computer science, robots, artificial intelligence, this is the one for you. Uh, the Navier-Stokes equation is probably my favorite, because I work in fluid dynamics. And the Navier-Stokes equations are all about fluid dynamics. Um, so we've had these equations for a couple, almost, almost 200 years now, and they describe the motion of pretty much any fluid uh, on Earth, and they work. Now, the issue is, this is a mathematical one, because the equations work perfectly for physicists and engineers, but from a maths perspective, we don't really understand the equations. So we don't know if they are well posed, is how we would describe this mathematically. So Fluid mechanics, fluids, I've got lots of cool experimental videos, um, boat for Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, the fourth one, the Hodge conjecture. Uh, this one's quite abstract. This is to do with abstract algebra. <laughs> the, the clue of it being abstract is in the name of the topic. Um, this one asks, if I have a particular solution, um, sorry, if I have a particular system of equations that I want to solve, are the solutions actually built from smaller pieces that uh, we understand. So I like to think of this as saying, uh, you know, is are these solutions like built from Lego? So it's like having a, a massive Lego universe. And in fact, the whole thing looks very complicated, but it's ultimately just built from little square bricks. So that's kind of, in some sense, what the Hodge conjecture is asking in a mathematical sense. Are these solutions built from simpler pieces? Uh, the fifth one. Uh, the Yang Mills mass gap hypothesis. This is a question, uh, almost like a philosophical question, asking us why do uh, particles, objects, why do things in general actually have mass? Um, so, sort of, it's sort of questions a little bit our understanding of what it means to have mass. Uh, and it's all to do with uh, the quantum world uh, and trying to, uh, the mathematical theory that underpins what's happening in the quantum world. Um, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. Um, so this is a picture of an iPhone. Uh, I'm not sure which model it is, but clearly not the new one though, um, as this is an old photo. Um, and this one actually talks about, um, again, solving a particular type of equation. Uh, these are called elliptic equations, and they're actually used in cryptography 
So we have this thing called elliptic curve cryptography, which is used to send data securely. And it's actually used by Apple on iMessage, which is why I have the picture of the iPhone. So if you have an iPhone, you are actually interacting with elliptic equations on a daily basis without even knowing it. So if you'd like to know more about those and what we don't understand about them, then vote for the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. And then the final one uh, is the Poincaré conjecture. Um, now this one gets a picture of a person because this is Gregory Perelman who has actually solved the Poincaré conjecture. So this is the only one of the seven over the last 20 years which has been solved. So unfortunately you cannot win the million dollars for this uh, because it was awarded to Perelman, though there's a whole story uh, around that. So if you want to hear a little bit more about what the Poincaré conjecture is, and it's all to do with spheres, if you want to hear more about that and the story behind uh, its solution, then vote uh, for the Poincaré conjecture. So uh, just to remind you all, uh, here are the problems. We've got Riemann hypothesis, P versus NP, Navier-Stokes, Hodge conjecture, Yang-Mills, um, Birch and Swinnerton Dyer, and Poincaré. So hopefully we can now open the first poll uh, and give you all the opportunity to vote for which of these you would like me to discuss first. So I'll probably spend around 10 to 15 minutes uh, talking through which, uh, each of the problems that you vote for. Uh, so hopefully we can squeeze three of them in uh, between now and seven o'clock. That is the plan. All right, I can see the results. Okay, what have we got here? Um, right, so we've got 13 votes for the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, so that is going to be our winner. Um, this one wins every time. <laughs> it's a good job I like talking about it. Uh, perhaps because it's the most famous and uh, a very notoriously difficult problem. Uh, so, to kick us off then, uh, the Riemann hypothesis. So again, as I said, this is all about prime numbers. Um, so it doesn't look like it's to do with prime numbers, <laughs> in fact, when you, when you sort of see the statement of the problem. But I will try to explain to you what it has to do with uh, prime numbers. So um, to kick us off, I've got a very short video uh, just introducing something called the, the Riemann zeta function, uh, which is the key uh, to this actual uh, problem. The Riemann zeta function. This is one of those objects in modern math that a lot of you might have heard of, but which can be really difficult to understand. Don't worry, I'll explain that animation that you just saw in a few minutes. A lot of people know about this function because there's a $1 million prize out for anyone who can figure out when it equals zero an open problem known as the Riemann hypothesis. So as Grant uh, informs us, we have this thing called the Riemann zeta function up here. Uh, I will talk a bit more about what that means, so don't worry if it's a very scary looking formula. Um, and we want to know when this is zero. That's what you've got to show to get your million dollars. When is this function equal to zero? Now, um, again, here is the formula um, in a little bit more detail. So the way this works, um, this symbol here is the zeta, which just tells you I'm talking about this particular function. Um, S, this is the input. So you can control the value of S, depending on which value of S you enter into this formula. You think of it as like your function machine from school. You plug in a value of S and the Riemann zeta function outputs some number. Now we want to know what values of S, when we plug them into our function, will then give us zero. That's what it means, when does this function equal zero? Now the other symbols, so the S is appearing here. So what we've got, this means uh, an infinite sum. So this means add together lots and lots of things where each of these things looks like one divided by N to the power S. So S doesn't change. And what we're going to do is plug in N starting at one. So the first number will be one divided by one to the power S. Then we count up to the next whole number. So then it would be plus one over two to the power S plus one over three to the power S. And we just keep adding forever. And again, we want to know when is this equal to zero? Now, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, why it can be zero and why it's a very, let's say, weird and wonderful function uh, in a moment. But first of all, I did promise you I would say what this has to do with prime numbers. So we want to know when this function is zero. Now you can do a very, very clever piece of maths, uh, which was first done by Euler. If you haven't heard of Euler, Euler is my favorite mathematician. He is incredible, uh, Swiss mathematician from the 1700s. Almost every single area of maths has an Euler's theorem because he just did, he did almost every single possible type of maths and not just studied it, but made 
incredible discoveries in almost every possible area of maths. Um, really, really incredible, um, incredible man. And so what he did was show that you can turn this infinite sum, so lots of things added together forever, you can turn that into um, this infinite product. So just like this being almost like E, capital sigma, looks a bit like an E, just like that means to add things forever, this capital pi means to multiply things together forever and ever. Um, so what he's done here is turn this sum, the zeta function, into this product where the p in this equation represents all of the prime numbers. So the idea is that if we understand what's happening with this function, then through this formula, it's going to allow us to have a better understanding of what's happening with the prime numbers. So that's the connection. It's this clever formula from Euler that relates when is the zeta function zero to the prime numbers. Now, um, so as I said there, solve, it's very, very likely the general consensus is that solving the Riemann hypothesis is probably going to require new knowledge of the prime numbers. So that is seen as the, um, the most promising route to a solution would be, well, let's understand the primes and that'll help us solve Riemann. So that's why it has this relationship with the prime numbers. So as I said, we want to know then when this function is zero. So let's plug in some simple values to get a bit of a feel for, for how it behaves and, and what happens for different values of s. So the, the simplest one you can plug in perhaps is going to be s equals one. So we plug in uh, one here. So you'll notice the, there was an s on this n on the bottom is now a one. So anything to the power one is just the number itself. So what we've now got is the sum from n equals one to infinity of just one divided by n. So the first few terms will be one divided by one plus one divided by two plus one divided by three plus one divided by four. And we will just carry on adding all of those things forever. Now, this is definitely not zero. Perhaps unsurprisingly, because what we're doing is we're adding small numbers, yes, and they do get smaller at each step, that's important. But we're adding together numbers and we're gonna just add them forever. So if we just keep adding things forever, then we're going to go to infinity. The whole sum is going to tend to infinity, or as I've used bad notation written here, equals um, infinity. Now this is, I've written here in, in bold, how do we show this? Because this is a little bit tricky. It's not immediately obvious uh, to anyone who isn't a mathematician why adding together all of these numbers will get you to infinity because they're getting smaller and smaller. So if you, know, if you go down 100 steps, you're <laughs> adding one over 100, which is a really small number. So how do we show this? This is one of my favorite proofs. Um, in all of maths. I was asked um, in a live stream I was doing a few months ago, actually, what is my favorite mathematical proof? Um, and this was the one that came to mind. So perhaps it is my favorite, or it's at least my favorite of the ones I can remember on the spot. Um, so it's very, very cool though. And hopefully you will enjoy me talking you through this. So the way it works is to group together um, the terms in this sum. And what I mean by that is we compare the first two terms so the first term is a one, and the next term is one half. So clearly one is greater than one half. So one is bigger than one half. This is hopefully a statement that nobody can possibly argue with. <laughs> one is bigger than a half. Now, what we wanna do now is, so we've looked at the first term and written it's bigger than something. Now, if we take the next two terms, a half plus a third, then we can say one half plus one third is bigger than something. And we want to think about, well, what do we write here? And the trick is to actually replace each one of these terms by the next smallest power of a half. So that's a little bit confusing perhaps at first. So here, one is a half to the power zero. So we're saying that a half to the power zero is bigger than a half to the power one. One is bigger than a half, that is true. Now we've got a half plus one half 
plus one third. So we want to replace the half with the next smallest power of a half. So that would be one quarter. A half times a half gives you one quarter. And similarly, we replace the one third with the next smallest power of a half. So that's also one quarter. So what we can say is that one half plus one third is greater than one quarter plus one quarter. Now, if you don't quite believe me, you can put these numbers in your calculator and it will give you a decimal that hopefully will make this immediately obvious. But this is a true statement. So we've got the first number is bigger than a half. The next two numbers are bigger than a quarter plus a quarter, but together, that's a half. So now, continuing the pattern, we're going to take the next four numbers. So that will be one quarter plus one fifth plus one over six plus one over seven. And we're going to replace each of them by the next smallest power of a half. So we have to go down to one over eight this time. So we have four terms, quarter, four, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, replace each of them by one divided by eight. Eight, 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 then this is true. Again, you can plug this in your calculator if you're not convinced by the fraction argument. So now we carry on. So the next line, we would take the next eight terms and replace each of them by one over 16. Then we take the next 16 terms and replace each of them by one over 32. And we keep going on like this forever. Now, if we do this forever, which hopefully I'll have a dot, dot, dot appear. Yeah, so the dot, dot, dot means carry on like this forever. Now, we've got a series of inequalities. So all of these inequalities say that the thing on the left, that side, is bigger than the thing on the right. So what that means is we can add all of these together. If we add everything on the left to itself, then the whole of that left-hand side is greater than everything on the right added together as well. So adding together everything on the left in this red shape, all of those things added together, that's one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, an eighth, a ninth, a tenth, and carrying on. So it's actually just this sum at the top because this is going forever. So what we've got is everything in the red carrying on in the same pattern is going to actually just give us exactly the sum that we are, that we are interested in. Gives us exactly <coughs> theta of one. Now, everything on the right-hand side, well, we've got a half. Then we've got two lots of a quarter. Well, that's a half. And then we've got four lots of an eighth. Well, that's a half. Then we would have eight lots of a sixteenth. Well, that's a half. So everything on the right-hand side is a half. And we've added together an infinite number of halves. So everything on the right in this green shape is just a half plus a half plus a half plus a half plus a half forever. So if I keep adding a halves together, so one half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, if I do that forever, I will get to infinity. I'm just continually adding a half. It's just like if I count forever, I will get to infinity. So what this means is um, that everything in the red, remember, added together, is bigger than everything added together in the green. So what we've shown is that this sum is greater than infinity. So the only thing greater than infinity is infinity itself. So the sum has to be infinity. Okay. So hopefully I've at least partially convinced you um, of, of the fact that this does indeed uh, go to infinity. So that was just when s equals one. Um, now, some interesting things um, can happen, as I've said, with this function. Um, it's important to, to realize that s does not have to be a real number. So s can be a complex number. Don't worry if you don't know what complex numbers are, but if you do, then that will hopefully mean something to you. Um, but it means that this function is, is actually way more complicated than it looks. Because when you plug in s as a complex number, some of these pluses become minuses. 
And that's how sometimes this sum can be zero. Because if you're just going to add things forever, it clearly can never be zero. You have to subtract something for it to be zero. So that's when what happens when S has a complex number value. Now, um, a couple of other favorites of mine are uh, zeta of two is another interesting one. So you plug in S equals two, and what you get here is one over one squared plus one over two squared, one over three squared, one over four squared, and you add all of these together. So it's very, very similar to zeta of one, except now the pieces that we, so we still add these pieces forever, but now they're a lot smaller because the one with two is actually a quarter. Whereas here it's a half. Then the one with three is now one over nine instead of one over three. Then it's one over 16 instead of one over four. So we're still adding things forever, but each piece is a lot smaller. And what happens here when you plug in two is the answer is pi squared divided by six. Now, I can prove this in, I think at last count, 11 different ways. And yet I'm still not entirely convinced that this is true because it's just one of those incredible mind blowing things, which makes absolutely no sense. And yet has to be true because I can do a mathematical proof to show that it is true. So this number is about 1.5 or 1.6. It's only, it's just a bit bigger than one and a half. Uh, but, so that in itself, I think is quite amazing that just by making these numbers squared, so they're really small, quite quick, you, instead of going all the way to infinity, you just stop at one and a bit. You know, you don't even get to two, which is, I think, quite incredible. And also like, where is pi coming from? Like what, absolutely like, what has pi got to do with this adding together square numbers? It's, it's ridiculous, it really is. Um, so in fact, so ridiculous <laughs> that here is an image of my, my tattoo and I can show you there underneath on my arm. Um, and this tattoo actually represents that series, that sequence, zeta of two, because this here represents zero, this first black line. Then the next black line uh, is a distance of one away. And then the next number would be one divided by two squared. So that's one quarter. So this line, this distance is one quarter of that original distance. So it's one plus one quarter plus one over nine is the next line, then 16 um, and then 25 and it carries on. And again, adding all of these together forever, you get your dotted line because you never quite get there because you have to go to infinity, um, which is pi squared over six is this dotted line. So these random lines tattooed on my arm are actually this uh, sequence, this series of zeta of two, which is possibly one of my favorite uh, results in all of maths. But as I said, I still don't believe it's really true, to be honest, it's, it's just insane. Um, and then the final one, uh, which I will just leave you with before we go to another vote, uh, is the following. This one's very famous, especially um, there's a number file video on it <laughs> where there's a lot of uh, heated debate shall we say online. So if you plug in um, S is equal to minus one, then what you do is if you've got a number on the bottom to the power minus one, that then puts it on the top. So what you then get is one plus two plus three plus four plus five, and you add all these numbers together forever. And now I'll give you a disclaimer. You have to use some very, very advanced maths and something called analytic continuation. So if you are interested, look up analytic continuation in your favorite analysis textbook. Um, but if you use this, you can argue that this sum is equal to uh, minus 1 12th, uh, which is something that was shown uh, by Ramanujan, um, who was an Indian mathematician who worked in Cambridge about 60 or 70 years ago now. So this is a weird and wonderful function. Um, but just to reiterate, if you want the million dollars, you need to prove um, when this function is zero or find um, a, a value when it is zero when the real part of s is not equal to a half. Because I should have mentioned that. We think that all of the points where this is zero have the real part of s equal to a half. So you either prove that's true, you get a million dollars, or the easiest way, though it's probably not actually true, so maybe not, 
the easiest way to get the million dollars is you just have to find one value of s that makes this sum zero where the real part of s is not a half if you can find that single counter example then you do get your million dollars right so i will leave that there uh for the riemann hypothesis so we can now uh hopefully open up um the uh second poll so we've got to remind you uh number two is p versus np algorithms computer science uh three navier stokes fluid mechanics lots of cool experiments uh four hodge conjecture this is all to do with um topology actually if, if that means anything to, to the mathematicians watching um five is going to be yang mills which is quantum theory uh, six, Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture, which is cryptography and elliptic curves. And then seven is the Poincaré conjecture, uh, which is the one that's been solved by Gregory uh, Perelman. Right, and we have the results. So we've got, um, it looks like Navier Stokes equations has just scraped in ahead of the Poincaré conjecture by a single vote. So I hope everyone who wanted to vote voted because your vote mattered in this particular case, as it always does. You have the chance to vote, you should always vote. Okay, no matter what it is you're voting for. Navier Stokes equations, I, I predicted would be number two after Riemann hypothesis, so I'm on a roll. So if we, when we get to the third vote, your job, everybody, is to not vote for the one that I have next in my presentation, all right? So try and, try and, be, try and be more random than, than I have predicted. Um, right, so Navier Stokes equations. Um, so again, just to, to summarize what I've said before, this is a set of equations, um, been around for uh, almost 200 years, uh, which model the, the motion, the flow, the behavior of um, all of these fluids uh, that we have on Earth. The way we define a fluid in, in fluid mechanics is something that changes shape to fit the container that it is inside. So that would be any liquid. Uh, that would also be any gas can be modeled by these equations. You have to make slight modifications, of course. Uh, and also um, even some solids. So, so things like ice, for example, the ice flow um, in a glacier, as if, if you've seen time-lapse videos, it kind of looks like a river if you speed it up to be like a whole year. Um, so again, you can actually model uh, the flow of glaciers using the Navier-Stokes equations with some slight modifications. So they're a really versatile set of equations, but what that means is the fact that they work in all these situations means they're pretty complicated mathematically. Um, now, again, I feel like this is now just turning into to me um, telling you about my favorite math equations and tattoos, because um, as much as I, I just told you about this, the lines on my arm. So I also study the Navier-Stokes equations. So I, I, of course, have a Navier-Stokes equations tattoo, uh, which I demonstrate in this little video. So, <laughs> this is a first for number five. On, on the ribs as well, the pain of the ribs, like, that's, I'm going to say this is complete commitment to, to Navier Stokes and fluid mechanics. Why did you do that? Well, and if you want to know why I did it, then you should watch that video. <laughs> if you search Navier Stokes equations, it'll come up on, on YouTube. It's about 30 minutes, so I'll probably go into more detail in that video than I will here. Anyway, um, so what I thought I would do to, to talk about and uh, demonstrate the, the, the idea behind this problem is to show you lots and lots of examples where the Navier-Stokes equations describe what's happening. Because I think the best way to get a feel for why they have to be so complicated mathematically is to just see the range of different things that can be explained perfectly by the same set of equations. So the first example I have here, when I now press play, um, is a beating heart. It's actually my heart uh, from three years ago now. So hopefully my heart still looks this good. Assuming this looks good, I don't actually know. Um, I, I did an ultrasound scan of my heart uh, for a radio program. I was like a guinea pig. Um, and I thought it was good to, to demonstrate here because what's happening is your, your heart, um, you know, your, your valves close, your heart squeezes, increases the pressure. Then the valves at the top open and that fluid, blood, is then pumped around your body because of the pressure gradient. So you have high pressure inside the heart, lower pressure in your arteries and veins. So that's why the blood actually flows because of this pressure gradient. So understanding blood flow 
and therefore understanding drug delivery means understanding fluid mechanics, which means solving the Navier-Stokes equations. So if we improve our mathematical understanding of Navier-Stokes, in theory, that can actually help us to design better drugs that enter your bloodstream faster and get to where they need to be uh, more quicker and therefore they're more efficient, they're better drugs in general for you know, people that need them. So, so there's like a lot of things I think people don't realize is that the, you know, there's really like advances in medicine, of course, which is hugely important in healthcare, which can be made through solving <laughs> mathematical problems like the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, <clears throat> another example um, here. So I need to explain this one before I press play. Um, so what I've got, sorry, let me just get a drink over. <clears throat> Tickle in my throat. So what we've got here um, is an experiment uh, from my uh, colleague Megan in Cambridge. And, and what she's got is a, a tank with two layers of fluid. Um, so we have the top layer, so they're separated by a metal barrier. So imagine like a two, two sections in a glass tank. The bottom layer is green and that fluid is uh, water, just tap water, fresh water. Then the fluid at the top, uh, it, it's green because it's been dyed with food coloring. Then the fluid at the top is salt water. So seawater, let's say, um, and that's clear. So green fluid on the bottom, fresh water wants to rise because it is less dense than the heavy salt water on top. So you put this metal barrier in the middle so that the salt water will stay on top. And then we're gonna remove the salt, remove the metal barrier like so, uh, and watch the awesome. So the metal barrier is removed. And now you see the green starts to rise. So remember the green fluid is light. And then the heavier clear fluid starts to sink. And you get this absolutely amazing, um, I don't even know, creature almost <laughs> that, that, that forms. Um, so you get these almost like mushroom clouds um, behavior. Now, this whole experiment and this whole situation, this is what Megan was studying for her PhD. And you just, this is exactly what we expect to happen up to the, the exact size of these mushroom clouds, exactly what is predicted by the Navier-Stokes equations. So it sounds like a reasonably simple idea, heavy stuff on top, light stuff on bottom, you know, they're gonna try and swap places, but you get this incredibly complex behavior. And this is perfectly explained by, by the same set of equations that describes how blood flows around my body. Um, so I've got another example, um, good old non-Newtonian fluids, um, classic. Some of you may have seen this experiment before. So what we have here, oh, it's got sound, it has had sound. But what we have here um, is a cornstarch, and you put this on a speaker and it behaves like a fluid until you turn the speaker on. It adds a force. And once you add a force to cornstarch, it then starts behaving like a solid. So this is a particular type of fluid, uh, which is called a non-Newtonian fluid. So um, that means that when you add a force, its viscosity changes is, is the property that changes. But a non-Newtonian fluid really is, is something where when, apply, when a force is applied, its properties change. So that's what's happening here. But again, this is exactly what's predicted by the Navier-Stokes equations. This is not, it's super cool to look at and almost like crazy that this happens, but this is what the Navier-Stokes equation says is gonna happen. Um, now my absolute favorite um, experiment here. So what we've got um, in this uh, circular cylinder sort of beaker is um, sugar solution. So think of it as syrup. Right, take your favorite syrup, corn syrup, golden syrup, maple syrup, let's go with maple syrup, but it's clear. Um, so it's just sticky, thick, sugary liquid. And what we've done is add three um, drops of food coloring. So obviously one is red, blue, yellow, uh, drops of food coloring. And now when I press play, this is gonna go forwards in time and stir this in a clockwise direction, three times, and then stop and then go backwards three times anti-clockwise. Now, the Navier-Stokes equations say that doing that experiment, we will get back to exactly where we started, which sounds ridiculous, right? 
Well, here we go. That's three times forwards. Now we're going backwards. Kind of like, uh, this is very similar to my uh, pi squared over six series that I was telling you about. <clears throat> like I, I, I told you this was gonna happen and I know this is gonna happen because Navier-Stokes equations say, this is what will happen. But I still don't really believe it, <laughs> despite having done this experiment myself. Um, but again, this is entirely predicted by, by this same set of equations. Um, now, the final two uh, experiments I'm gonna show you. Um, so these actually, emphasize what we don't understand about the Navier-Stokes equation. So everything so far makes complete sense and we are happy. Now, the issues with these equations mathematically, there are two. So the first issue is that within the equation, um, you can get things that we call singularities. So um, in physics, for example, a singularity, you can think of that as a black hole. It's, it's something of infinite density. Uh, so that would be like a singularity in, in like a physics uh, sense. Now, mathematically, a singularity means dividing by zero. It means things going to infinity. Because as you divide by a smaller and smaller number, if you do one divided by a really small number, the answer is huge. So if you did one divided by zero, it should give you infinity. So that's a singularity. And these things aren't really allowed uh, mathematically. And one example, uh, or one problem with the Navier-Stokes equations is we don't really understand why we sometimes get these singularities. So in particular, we don't understand um, something called vortex reconnection um, is, is the sort of technical term if you want to go away and find out more. Um, and you can think of this as having two, if you had like two tornadoes that were separate and then they kind of merge together to form one slightly bigger tornado. Now that process can happen physically, but mathematically the equations don't work anymore. Well, they should work because they work in every other possible situation. Um, and one way that um, this, this experiment, I really like this because it's a way of trying to picture what a singularity might look like um, in, in a physical sense with a fluid. So what we've got here is two uh, metal wires, sort of circular shaped metal wires, um, and they're dipped in soap solution. So like the stuff you'd use to blow bubbles, make bubbles when you were a kid, or maybe now, I mean, I was doing this a few weeks ago, so clearly you can do it when you're an adult as well. And, and you dip this in the soap solution and then you slowly move the wires apart. And this shape is, as you move apart, the shape shrinks and then pops. So if you watch this incredibly slow motion here, this is like 10,000 frames per second or something. So we're moving the rings apart, you can't even tell, and then suddenly you get this explosive um, change in the shape. So I'll just play that one more time because it's really cool. Um, so what's happening here, and the reason we think of this as a singularity is you've got this very, very, very small change in, in the height, and yet you get this explosive response in the change in the volume of your soap bubble. So this would be sort of akin to a mathematical singularity. Uh, and then the other thing that we don't understand very well at all about the Navier-Stokes equations uh, is how they relate to chaotic motion. Um, so, so chaos, um, mathematically, it has, a, it has a definition, but basically it's just inherently random things, like things that are so random that you have absolutely no chance of predicting what's going to happen. Um, my favorite example that I have in my head for this is if you have two waves uh, let's say in the sea, crashing into each other. Like, you, you know, like, you know, they're going to hit each other and then kind of, you know, eventually it will go calm. But the individual movement of the, of the, like, the frothy white bit is just, it's insanely random. Like, you've got no chance of actually, like, expertly predicting exactly what every particle will do in that situation. You just can't possibly do that. Um, so, and here's another experiment of the similar kind of idea. So, so what we've got here 
is a square tank just filled with water. Um, and then um, someone's gone like this with their hand in the tank to create uh, turbulence, which is just like random motion. So they've just created some waves randomly by like stirring the tank. And the whole thing is going to rotate as well. So you've got a big rotating tank and the water's just sloshing about everywhere randomly. And then we've got two drops of dye, a red one and a green one. So now when I press play, it's the most random thing <laughs> I think I've ever seen. So this experiment was done, I think like a hundred times and every single time something different happened because you just can't possibly predict what's going to happen. So like, what on earth's going on with this big red bit? Like, why did that break away and form here? And then you try and repeat the experiment and that just doesn't happen. And then here you've got like the two bits mixing. Here you've got just a green bit by itself. Like, it's just super random. Um, and this is like uh, an experiment demonstrating turbulence, which is this chaotic random motion. And the problem with the Navier-Stokes equations is at the moment, we don't know how they interact and relate to turbulence and chaotic motion. So, so if you, you can't actually use them to properly understand and model turbulence. So kind of the, the route to the million dollars is gonna be helping us to understand singularities better. So this idea of mathematically dividing by zero and, or, or sorry, my, these are just my opinions on how to win the million or by helping us to construct an actual theory for turbulence that also sort of coincides with the Navier-Stokes equations. So that's the second one. Um, so I believe we've got uh, five left and uh, I can't actually see what time it is, but I think we've got about 10 minutes left or so. So we should just be able to, be able to get through the uh, third and final one for you all to vote. So the third poll is now open. Right, so we've got a winner over here, which is Oh, it was very close. So we've got 17 for Poincaré and 14 for Yang Mills. So pretty close. They were clearly the two favorites, uh, but it is the Poincaré projection that's going to win. Um, and I, you know how I said, make sure you don't pick the one that was next in my slides. All right, so I'm not cheating here, right? I'm only using a clicker. So I go next and then I'm going to go next once more. I think you actually went against me. Yes, okay, <laughs> well done everybody. You didn't pick the one that I thought you were going to pick. So I'm actually gonna have to go over and use my mouse now um, to skip through to the Poincaré conjecture. This was the fourth one I had on the, uh, on the ordering of the slides. That's always the tricky one. I always have Riemann first, then Navier Stokes, and then it's, it's always a toss up between P versus MP or Poincaré. Though you all seem to be voting for Yang Mills. So I was thinking I was just off putting P versus MP in third. Right, so uh, the Poincaré conjecture, as I said, uh, pretty exciting because it's the only one that's actually been solved. Uh, so it immediately <coughs> makes it a out uh, contender. Everyone wants to know the story. How was it solved? What happened, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so before I tell you the story, I just want to talk a little bit about the problem itself. Because um, of course, this is a maths talk. Um, so the, uh, the sentence written here is any smooth, finite shape with no holes, a sphere. So what we mean here uh, is if I have something um, which is smooth, so that means no sharp edges. So here you want to picture um, a ball of blue tack or a ball of Play-Doh. So imagine having a ball of blue tack or Play-Doh in your hands, right? It can be kind of any shape you want as long as it's got no like really spiky bits, which can't happen with blue tack or Play-Doh. So you're fine. <laughs> so it's definitely smooth. Uh, it's finite. So if something is finite, it means you can put it in a box. It might need to be a very big box, but you can still put it in a box. So again, if we're picturing holding a ball of Play-Doh, it's definitely finite. Uh, it's got no holes. So that means, you know, you can't like thread string through it and out the other side. Um, so for example, a donut is a classic example of a shape which has a single hole in the middle. A polo mint, of course, also has a single hole in the middle. Uh, your coffee cup has a single hole um, as well in, in the handle because the bit inside the mug, you can't get all the way out the bottom. So that's not a hole. It's an indent, a very large indent, but it's not a hole. But the handle bit is actually a hole because you can thread something through. Um, so we've got a ball of Play-Doh, uh, which I can hold in my hand and it has no holes. Then the Poincaré conjecture says that I can deform that ball and turn it into a sphere. 
And when I say deform, what that means is you're allowed to squish it, squash it, roll it, roll it up. You're allowed to pull it a little bit if you want, stretch it. What you can't do is you cannot add or remove holes. Okay, it's really, really important when we say, talk about, this is actually topology. We talk about smooth deformations. And what that means is you can't add or remove holes. So again, if I start with my blue tack, maybe I've got a donut made out of blue tack, then I'm not allowed to remove that hole in the middle. So I could never turn that, um, I could never turn my donut made out of blue tack into a sphere because that would require me to close that hole, which I'm not allowed to do. So this, this says smooth finite shape with no holes a sphere. This is what Planck trajectory says, and we know this is true because it's been proven. Now the tricky bit, so I've hopefully convinced you, you could do this with three in 3D, right? If you have a 3D ball of blue tackle Play-Doh, then you can do it. You can literally do this experiment yourself and it works. Now the Poincaré conjecture says, this is not just true in three dimensions. This is actually true in any number of dimensions that you can, that you want. So literally up to dimension N where N is any number, right? So it could be 4 billion, it could be six, it could be 22. However many dimensions you want to work with, this still is true. Now, the other thing to bear in mind when you're moving between dimensions, what we mean by a sphere is obviously going to change. So a two-dimensional sphere would be a circle and a one-dimensional sphere would be a dot. And then a three-dimensional would be an actual sphere. A four-dimensional sphere, also called a hypersphere, is pretty funky to look at. Like we can't really, I can't show you one because it's 4D, our world is 3D, uh, but you can certainly get some cool graphics or animations if you Google hypersphere or 4D sphere. So we have ways of visualizing higher dimensional objects. But what we mean by sphere is a sphere in that number of dimensions. Right, so the history of this problem um, is as follows. So it was actually back in uh, 1904, French mathematician Henri Poincaré uh, proposes the conjecture. So he says, it's very obviously true in one, two, and three dimensions, as I've just explained, dot, circle, sphere, it's clearly true. You can actually do these experiments yourself. It works. And so Poincaré says, well, I think it's true in any number of dimensions in 1904. Now, it takes uh, 57 years <laughs> before anyone proves this. So an American mathematician called Stephen Smale, uh, shown here in this selfie with me, um, it, he comes along in 1961 and he proves the Poincaré conjecture is true in dimensions six and above. So we know it's true in number one, two, and three. Stephen Smale shows it's true in six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc., all the way up to infinity. And so now what we're missing is n equals five, five dimensions, and also n equals four, four dimensions. So it takes another 22 years for another American mathematician, Michael Friedman, who then shows it's true for n equals five. So now uh, 79 years since the problem was first proposed by Poincaré, we've got it's true for every single dimension except four. So the curious minded people among you will be thinking in this situation, well then why doesn't four, like what's so special about four? Is there, is there something special about four? Or have we just not figured it out yet? Like, why would it, if it's true in every other dimension, what, why is it not true for four? Um, and basically that is what became the millennium problem. So in the year 2000, because this has been around now for 96 years, we still didn't have a proof that it was true or not true, maybe, in, in four dimensions. So then it became the millennium problem. Now in uh, 2002, Perelman, um, this Russian mathematician, uploads a proof of the Poincaré conjecture uh, to an online uh, repository called the Archive. Now, this is a uh, website where anybody can just publish their research, uh, ma uh, mainly maths and physics, but also some other science stuff as well. Um, so he just uploads without any sort of fanfare or announcement. He just sort of quietly posts this proof on the Archive saying, I've, you know, it's the Poincaré conjecture. 
he don't think he even said that. I think he just said, you know, I've shown this is true. And it turned out that that was the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, now, this is a very peculiar way to sort of announce you've proven a big mathematical theorem, because I think most people uh, perhaps would sort of like, you know, shout it from the rooftops, like, I've done this, please give me my million dollars, this is awesome. Uh, but he just sort of quietly went about his day-to-day -day business and just, you know, posted it on the internet, all done. Um, so it actually took quite a while for this to be checked, because when you publish uh, maths, it has to be uh, what we call peer-reviewed. So that means some of your colleagues, people who work in the same uh, area of maths as you, um, who are therefore hopefully qualified enough to check your work, will go through, sit down and read your several hundred page proof and check that it is indeed correct. So it actually took four years uh, before the proof was confirmed to be correct. And then in 2006, Perelman was uh, awarded the Fields Medal, uh, which is the seen by many as the highest prize you can receive as a mathematician, almost like a Nobel Prize for maths is the sort of cliche. Uh, so he was awarded this in 2006, now he turned this down in 2006. Um, I don't particularly want to speculate why, because we don't know. He, he hasn't given any interviews or, you know, there isn't a, any, he isn't very much known about Perelman other than he was a mathematician working in Russia at a university. Uh, but he turned down the Fields Medal in 2006. And then in 2010, he was then awarded the Millennium Prize. I'm not quite sure why it took another four years, but it did. And then finally, the Clay Institute said, yes, this is uh, worthy of the million dollar prize. And then he also turned that down as well. So not only did he very quietly just post it on the internet without any kind of attention, he then turns down the biggest award you can receive as a mathematician and the million dollar prize. Now, as I said, there are various stuff you can read on the internet as to why, but it is just all gossip and rumor because he's never given an interview. So we don't know. Um, but what we do know is he was actually working on this problem, the Poincaré conjecture for n equals four. He was working on this since the early 1990s. So he obviously was working on it because he thought it was a really cool, interesting maths problem not because it was worth a million dollars, because he was working on it for 10 years before it even became um, one of the million dollar prizes. So as I said, if you want to know more about the, the gossip and rumors around why he may have turned this down, again, give it a Google search. There's lots of stuff out there, but none of it from Perelman. I think that is very important to stress. Uh, it would be so cool to actually be able to interview him, um, but he's kind of disappeared. Um, but the, the other interesting thing that I'll leave you with is so he solves the problem. And now if you estimate the amount of time that Gregory Perelman spent trying to solve the Poincaré conjecture, perhaps including a little bit of like the training required. So for example, doing his degrees, et cetera, et cetera. And you look at the number of hours he spent. And then if you take the million dollars, which he turned down, but let's pretend, you know, you take the million dollars, divide it by all of the hours spent solving the millennium problem it works out as less than minimum wage um, as your hourly rate. So in other words, it's pretty amazing you get a million dollars for solving a maths problem, but it is important to remember that you're kind of doing this for the love of it uh, rather than just for the money. So I think that's a very nice message uh, for us to finish on. Um, if you do, uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I will just say, if you do have any other questions or we don't get to your questions, please feel free to send me a message. My website, tomrocksmaths.com, there's a contact form, come straight to my email, or ping me on social media at tomrocksmaths, and I can, we can happy to chat about anything uh, that I've spoken about, but I will quickly hand over to Kathy. Thank you, Tom. Um, so we have reached the scheduled end of tonight's session, but do feel free to hold on here for another few minutes if you would like to. We can keep the session open maybe until 10 past. So we've got about five or six minutes for questions. But if you do have something you need to get on to, um, then do post your questions to Tom um, online. Um, so we've got a question from Chantal. Um, what should you do if you answer one of the questions? What's the process? Oh, that's a great question. Um, okay, so uh, you could, of course, do what Perelman did, 
that's option one, <laughs> post something on the archive. Um, but what I would say is the way maths research goes in general is you're, you're working on a problem. You, um, you think you make progress. So of course it's very important. You don't know if you've made progress until you've read pretty much everything that everyone else has done around that problem beforehand. So, so it's very important to, to, if you are serious about trying to tackle one of these, first of all, you, you do need a maths degree, like let's be honest. Um, and you also need to read a lot around the subject to make sure you're not repeating something that somebody else has already done. Plus that will also give you ideas of what looks promising and what doesn't. So if you have, and uh, actually think you've solved one of these, what you would do is you would write a publication, a manuscript, like in any other uh, academic subject. Um, you would then submit this to a journal the journal will then arrange for it to be checked. So this is the process of peer review, like I was saying. So it's, it's initially checked by an editor to make sure it, it's at least worthwhile of somebody doing the peer review process. And then it will be sent to three, depending on the journal, three or four people. They will be people who are experts in that area. They will check through all of your work, give you feedback, maybe, you know, some things to change or, or things that they think are brilliant, you know, like positive and negative feedback. And eventually, if it is indeed correct, with perhaps some modif slight modifications, it will be published in the journal, which is sort of like the, the stamp of authority to say, this has been checked by lots of other mathematicians. So we're like 99.9% .9 sure this is actually legit. This is a real solution. And then perhaps the Clay Institute would probably then like, you know, pay attention and check it themselves and possibly award you the million dollars. So, so I get asked this question a lot. If you are an, an amateur mathematician and you're trying to solve a big problem, it's incredibly important that you actually write up your findings in the format of a publication because it's very difficult for anyone else in the community to be able to check it and understand it unless it's in that format that they are used to working with um, in, the, in their jobs. So you really do need to show your workings. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you, can't, you can't just do like, what's it? Um, you can't just do Fermat and write in the margin. I have a magnificent proof of this, which the margin is too small to contain. <laughs> yeah, that was a classic. It took 350 years to solve that after he claimed that in the margin. So, wow. yeah, you can't get away with that. You've got to, you've got to show your working. <laughs> Great. Um, so we've got another question. Why were these particular questions elected as the million dollar questions? Um, now that's again a very very good question. So the the original statement I showed you that said it must be a classical problem that has resisted solution. That's kind of all we know um, as like outsiders to that meeting of the advisory board. That was what was released as the condition to be one of these problems. Um, so again, unless unless you happen to be able to speak to somebody who was in that meeting, and you can look at who were these these mathematicians were. Um, I think quite a lot of them are still alive because it, it was 20 years ago. A few of them have passed away, but the majority, I think, are still around. You could perhaps try and ask them, how did they pick uh, these problems? But in terms of the actual conditions, it was just the idea was to pick things that mathematicians had really struggled with. It was to like lay down the gauntlet and be like, you know, for the last 50 years, the brightest minds in the field have been trying to solve this. For whatever reason, they haven't been able to. So let's try and attract others by sort of the incentive of money. That's kind of one way of looking at what they were trying to do. So I think it was really, they just tried to pick like the hardest unsolved problems in maths. As I said, not necessarily the ones that would have the biggest impact. Great, thank you for that. So we've actually had three questions come in that are almost identical, which is basically yep. if you had to choose a million dollar question, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> wow. If I had to pick a million dollars. Well, I can tell you um, one of my, my favorite problems that is unsolved, which is not a millennium problem, uh, but would certainly be worthy of it, uh, is the Goldback conjecture. Um, so I always forget exactly what this is, uh, because, uh, but it, it's roughly, so, so don't take my word as this is exactly what the problem is. But, um, and you should just look Goldback, G-O-L-D, B A C H go back conjecture. Uh, so it talks about, I think, the idea that every number is the sum of two primes. I think something like that. It's like a really nice, simple thing, 
along those lines, as I say, I always get it muddled in my head for whatever reason. It's a really nice, simple thing that just says you can make any number by adding together two prime numbers, um, which sounds like almost too straightforward to be true. Well, you think, oh yeah, of course, that makes complete sense. But for some reason, we can't prove it. Like you can test it. You can take any number you want and test it and it works. But of course, that's not a mathematical proof. Uh, you have to show that it is true beyond all, you know, true to infinity in some sense. Um, so yeah, I think that one to me would be, it's, it's a, that one's like unsolved for I think several hundred years. Uh, and it just has such a nice, simple statement. And yet for whatever reason, we can't prove it. So I think that one would be worthy of a million dollars. Right. Um, which of the existing problems do you think will be the next one to be solved? <laughs> um, okay, there's a couple of answers to this. So I know the most about Navier Stokes. And I know lots of my old colleagues in Cambridge who are doing amazing work in that area. And also um, Terence Tao over at UCLA has made a lot of progress recently. And he is pretty much a genius. Like he is absolutely a genius, in fact. Um, he's one of those mathematical prodigies. So, so I think Navier Stokes is, is getting there. Like we're making quite, but that might just be because I know the most about it. Um, I think Riemann, it wouldn't surprise me. Like even though Riemann is the one that's been around the longest and has the most unsuccessful attempts, just because it's the most famous means more people are trying it than any other. So just by the laws of probability, the law of large numbers says it's perhaps the most likely one to be solved next. Uh, so either Riemann or Navier Stokes, I would have to say. Right, well, let, let's just keep watching. And then we do have <laughs> one final question, which probably doesn't relate to uh, the $7 million questions, but I'm still intrigued. Um, your tattoo of the pokeballs what does that represent uh, so i have two so i don't know how well you can see these i've got the one there which is the pixelated uh pokeball and then i have the realistic pokeball uh here like the 3d version so i have the two on my arm um so the funny story there is i wanted a pokeball tattoo because i absolutely love pokemon uh, i played it since i was like six and i've bought i've bought and completed every game that's came out since original from red and blue like even last year i bought the new one and it's awesome um, and i still play it now so i really just love pokemon uh, but the story behind the two is i couldn't decide to get the old like pixelated game boy one or the realistic 3d one and my tattoo artist kind of said oh, why don't you get both um, so he got double the fee i got two tattoos um, and yes yeah, so mainly just because i love pokemon to be honest <laughs> and my favorite Pokemon, because I know people like to know this, I have two Pokemon, other Pokemon tattoos of Butterfree and Zapdos, which are both on my leg. So I can't show you because I've got jeans on. But they're my favorite two uh, Pokemon. Well, I think that is the perfect point for us to stop. Thank you so much, Tom, for enlightening us with those um, mathematical problems. I have to say my mind is still blown by the Navier Stokes being able to unstir those, uh, those <laughs> silly thoughts. I couldn't yeah. actually believe that, but um, <laughs> it's been a fantastic session. Uh, I think we've all learned something. I certainly have, dredging back my A-level maths. Um, but thank you, Tom, for an amazing session. And we will see everybody at the next event. Thank you so much and good night. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.